All right, Genesis chapter 5. Let's look at verse number 1 there. The Bible reads, This is the book of the generations of Adam. In the day that God created man, in the likeness of God made he him, male and female created he them, and blessed them, and called their name Adam in the day when they were created. Now we went over this a little bit um, in Genesis chapter 1. But I want to cover it a little bit today as well where it says, you know, we see here again that God created man, verse number one, in the likeness of God. So when God created man, it was in God's likeness. It was, it was in his image. And, and if you remember in Genesis chapter one, verse 27, he said, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. This is the same exact wording. Now, God created man in his own image. He did not create woman in his own image. And this is made very clear in both of these references. It says, um, you know, in Genesis 5 where we just were, and that day God created man in the likeness of God made he him. And they both say the same thing. Male and female created he them. So God made man in God's image, and then out of man he created woman, but woman was not created in God's image. And it's an important distinction because we live in a world today, in a society where people are trying to neuter God. They're trying to make God gender, gender neutral. And it is a very important distinction to understand that God is not gender neutral. Obviously, we have God the Father, and we have God the Son, and we have God the Holy Ghost. Two out of the three of those are masculine, father and son. He didn't say mother and daughter. He said father and son. And, and this is always how God's referred to throughout the Bible, is as the father, as the son, as the king, not as the queen, right? Everything is always masculine. And God made men and women to be different. And this is one of the reasons why, um, and turn if you would to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, because this is an important concept to get down. You might think it's not that big of a deal, but um, it, it really is because there's people that are attacking this today and it's been under attack for a very long time. You think of even, even the pictures of the so-called you know, paintings and pictures of people trying to depict what Jesus Christ looked like are false. You already see people trying to blur the lines between the genders and just assuming that Jesus Christ, for, for whatever reason, it was actually, I don't know who the first person was to make that depiction, but I know for a fact that a sodomite, who was a very popular paint um, artist, was one of the ones that, that, that has all the famous um, paintings of, of Jesus Christ where he has that long hair. And we see in 1 Corinthians 11, um, of course, this chapter explains that it's a shame for a man to have long hair. You see, when God created men and women, He created us different. He, he, he um, that, you know, there's very obvious physical differences between men and women. You could, you should be able to look at a man or look at a woman and be able to tell based on their anatomy and based on the way that they look and the way that they dress and the way that they speak and the way that they walk and the way they talk. Everything about them, you should be able to tell the difference. Because there are masculine and feminine attributes to a man and a woman. And I know this is extremely stupid simple, but we're living in a society today where you can look at someone walking down the street sometimes and have no idea whether or not that person is a man or a woman. Because you've got these ladies cutting, shaving their head down, down to buzz cuts and, and doing all kinds of crazy things. And you have men wearing these, their hair down to, down to their rear end. And it's confusion. And God does not, is not the author of confusion. He wants the man to be like the man and the woman to be like the woman. And we see here in 1 Corinthians 11, this is very um, fitting as well in 1 Corinthians 11 because we were just reading Genesis chapter 1, Genesis chapter 5, talk about man being in the image of God. We're going to see those same, the similar wording in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Look at verse number 3. He says, But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ and the head of the woman is the man and the head of Christ is God. Every man praying or prophesying, having his head covered, dishonoreth his head. But every woman that prayeth or prophesieth with her head uncovered 
dishonoreth her head. For that is even all one as if she were shaven. For if the woman be not covered, let her also be shorn. But if it be a shame for a woman to be shorn or shaven, let her be covered. For a man indeed ought not to cover his head. Look at, here's the reason why. Now, as far as the covering and everything, I preach an entire sermon called Dishonoring Your Head, which, which goes without a doubt can prove that when he's talking about the covering here, he's talking about your hair. And it's very easy to prove that from this chapter, that he goes back and forth between a person being shaven and, and being covered. And then it's, it explicitly says that a covering, the woman's covering, her hair is giving her for a covering. It just flat out says it. So don't tell me that this is talking about hats or this is talking about some other things you put on your head because it's not. But this is why it's important. Verse number seven says, For a man indeed ought not to cover his head, not to have long hair. Why? For as much as he is the image and glory of God. So the reason why the man is not supposed to cover his, his, his head with long hair is because he is the image and glory of God. He is that image. God made man in his own image. So does that mean that God has long hair? Of course not. It means he absolutely does not have long hair. If he's saying, you shouldn't have long hair, oh man, you shouldn't have your head covered because you're in the likeness and image of God. Therefore, God must not have really long hair. Okay? And it says, but the woman is the glory of man. For the man is not of the woman, but the woman of the man. Neither was the man created for the woman, but the woman for the man. Flip back, if you would, to Genesis chapter 5. We're going to go back to that. But um, we see here that God does care because we're made in His image and in His likeness. And if God doesn't have long hair, and if it says it's a shame for a man to have long hair, it says, doth not, doth not even nature itself teach you that there's a shame for a man to have long hair? Then there's no way that Jesus Christ had long hair. Yet that's what 99% of people today think about when they think of Jesus Christ because these, these images, these pictures have been you know, distributed all over the place to where now Jesus Christ is synonymous to a man having really long hair and just being real soft smoking and almost like a stoner these days, it seems like, yeah, let's love one another. Like this is the image, this is the portrayal of Jesus Christ. A lot of that has to do with Hollywood, the sodomites that run Hollywood, just like the sodomites that are behind the paintings of Jesus Christ that paint him with long hair. Because it's a mockery, they know that having long hair is a shame and that's why they put it on the Son of God. Jesus Christ did not have long hair and God does not have long hair. Because we are made in the image of God. And, and Jesus Christ was a man. He was the Son of God. God the Father is the Father. He's masculine. So don't, you know, I, I heard a side of my once say that she said, I think that, you know, God's a woman. And I was thinking, what a blasphemous thing to say. I mean, just the Bible very clearly and distinctly over and over again says the Father never once mentions anything about being female and then just saying that God's a woman. Like, I didn't understand it at the time. Of course that kind of filth is going to come out of the mouth of a sodomite. Of course it is. I didn't get it. I mean, at the time I was just kind of blown away, but I wasn't living for God. I was saved, but I didn't really know a lot. And, and I was still kind of like shocked to hear that. And it bothered me, but I didn't say anything because I was living a wicked life and, and I didn't want to be a hypocrite in, in saying anything about my faith to anybody because of the way that I was living. And, um, and that was wrong and it was shameful for me as a person to, to be at that point where I couldn't even express the, the, how, how, um, how I felt about that and the, the blasphemy that I heard. And I even had a, a friend, a female friend that was a sodomite, but um, that was quite a while ago. And, um, and it, like I said, it was a shame. But it doesn't surprise me, especially looking back now, that that would come out of their mouth. And, um, you know, don't, don't fall for this gender neutral stuff because the Bible is very clear about it. Now, um, continuing on here in, in Genesis 5, we're going to see this entire genealogy. Now, one of the things I want to point out, we're not going to read through all of, the, all of the, every verse going back for each person and how old they were when they gave birth and how old they were when they died. But um, there are some things that I want to point out that I think are very interesting about this chapter. 
One of them was looking to see how old people lived at this time, before the flood especially. I mean, you see Adam, you know, living to be 930 years old when he died. That's incredible to me. I mean, you stop and think about that. There's some people who want to say that like, oh, the years were a lot shorter than or something. I don't buy that for a second. Um, time hasn't changed that drastically at all. There's no evidence to support that. Um, actually, it makes sense that men were living longer. We live in a world, even just by our, our laws of, of science and physics, we live in a world where everything is getting more and more disordered. It's called entropy, where, where things um, do not become more ordered. They become more disorganized uh, as time goes on. That's why things decompose. They don't, they don't compose themselves together and get better. They, they break down. People deteriorate. Our bodies will end up failing. We grow old. We die. It's, it's the natural life cycle of everything in the earth is like that. Everything ends up just growing and getting worse and worse and worse. And um, this is the, the, the world that we live in. We have that physical evidence to see that. But if you think about when, when God um, first made Adam and Eve, he made them perfect. It would make sense that they're not going to have all of these other you know, genetic problems and other issues that we see today. I mean, through different types of breeding, now if, if a man and a woman were, or if a, like a brother and sister were to get married and have kids, you're going to have all kinds of genetic defects with their children because of the, the genes that are, that, are, that are coming together. Um, and you have that much more likelihood of, of the, the bad traits joining together and, and, and having all these problems. We have the albinos and all, the, you know, all, all kinds of different problems from, from these incestuous relationships, which they didn't have, of course, back in the time with Adam and Eve. You think of Adam and Eve were the first two people to, to um, be on this earth. Their children had to marry each other in order to, to procreate, in order to have children, in order for the earth to be overspread with people. It had to happen. There's no other way that this could have happened because God talks about making Adam and he talks about making Eve. And there was, you know, it doesn't mention anything about creating anybody else like he made Adam out of the ground. From that point, everyone was born into this world. And um, because of their perfection in the genetics, they didn't have to worry about these problems. But after many, many, you know, years have gone by, a, thousand, a couple thousand years, then in the Mosaic Law, of course, God makes it against the law. He says, okay, you're near of kin, essentially. Um, you're not allowed to, to marry. And um, again, it makes perfect sense. But think about this. Think about the knowledge. Think about the knowledge that you would have if you could even live to be like two or three hundred years old. I think about where I'm at. I'm 37 years old today. And I'm con you're constantly learning. You're constantly increasing your knowledge. The older that you get, right? I mean, start off as a child, you know almost nothing and you, and you keep learning and growing and learning. And a lot of stuff that you learn, you learn by experience, you learn by doing. There's a lot of things that I've learned about working on my car, about working on other things, working on things with my hand by doing them and by you know reading about them and doing them and getting advice from other people, especially older people. Anytime I have a problem with, with things around the house, I typically will call my father you know, he's, he's a lot older than I am. He's worked on a lot more things than I have. He's a good resource. Or other people I know that do a specific trade. You gain this knowledge just over time. The longer you live. Think about being able to live for hundreds of years. The amount of wisdom and the amount of knowledge you would gain over that time is just incredible. Yet we're, everything we're taught, it seems, from a humanistic viewpoint, everything is backwards. Because they'll tell you, you know, I talked about this one of the other weeks about the Stone Age and Neanderthal men and all this, and how stupid people were and how we are just so extremely smart today. And man has lifted themselves up in our pride of just saying, oh, you know, we just have all of this knowledge and all this wisdom. I guarantee you Adam was a much, much smarter man than anybody that's on the face of this earth today. Adam was learning directly from God. And Adam lived to be over 900 years old. I mean, I don't care if you don't read books. You, just, you live to be that long. You're going to get a lot of experiential knowledge and wisdom of, of just being around for that long. That's amazing. And we see that, that this happens. This trend happens. And um, 
you know, there's various ages. The, the oldest person that we see in the Bible is um, Methuselah. Methuselah lived to be 969 years old. 969 years. That's the, the, the oldest per recorded age of a person in the Bible was Methuselah. That's a really long time. I mean, it's almost a thousand years. You think about it, we live to be maybe 70, 80 years old, average man. A thousand years. That's ten, the more than 10 times as is, is long of a lifetime. That's, that's pretty amazing. But then we see after the flood, of course, then people start to, that, that number shrinks. It gets smaller. Um, the, you know, it gets down to like 600, 500, 400, 300, 200, and, and it gradually just, just kind of levels off up until in the book of Psalms, I think it is, where it says that, um, where, where David was saying, you know, a, a, the man's days are 70 years, or um, if he's lucky, and I'm paraphrasing, um, you know, four score, 80, it's like 70, 80 years. And that was around the time of David, and that's kind of a lot of the way things are still today. So it seems to have leveled off after that decrease. But it makes sense. I mean, um, with, with the way that the world is and the, the, the entropy, the things getting disordered. But this was pretty amazing. I just wanted to point that out. So let's, let's, um, let's get into this geneal genealogy a little bit. Um, genealogies in general, they, they have a good use. Now, I know for a long time with myself, when I start reading the Bible, you dread coming up to like First Chronicles. Because First Chronicles, Chronicles in general, just has a lot of genealogies. And all you're doing is reading names. And you think to yourself, why do I need to know this? Why do I care about all of these names? It's just a bunch of names. They're all dead. This is the Old Testament. What do, I, what do I even care about this anymore? Now, there's a lot of reasons that the genealogies are in here. Okay. Um, there is definitely a use for it in the Old Testament, but it doesn't just end at the Old Testament. We'll, we'll get into this. Uh, turn, if you would, to Nehemiah chapter 7. Nehemiah, keep your finger in Genesis 5. We'll be right back to it. Nehemiah chapter number 7. Nehemiah is before the book of Psalms, before the book of Job, before the book of Esther, if, you, if you're going kind of from the middle. Seven. And Nehemiah chapter seven. Now, Ezra, Nehemiah are these, are these books, uh, these men that, that lived around the time where... Um, the children of Israel were going back into their land. They had been taken captive, they've been gone for a long time, and now they're going to go back. And this is um, in these chapters when they build the temple again, the second building of the great temple, right? Um, after they've been, been taken captive. So, what they're doing here, and we have a, a you could look at chapter 7, you don't even have to really read it, but if you just look down, um, you'll see a lot of names. It's giving this whole register of people. And we see here, look at verse number 5 of chapter 7. It says, And my God put into mine heart to gather together the nobles and the rulers and the people, that they might be reckoned by genealogy. So see, we're, God cares about the genealogy in the Old Testament here. Because it says, God put into my heart. He's saying, God wanted me to do this. He said, wanted me to reckon the people by genealogy. And it says, um, And I found a register of the genealogy of them which came up at the first and found written therein. And he tells you everything that was written, all these people that were written there. And then jump down to verse 63 of chapter 7 because it gives all these names and, it's, and, it, and it you know, tells um, who kind of begotten who. 
Verse number 63 says, And the priests, the children of Habiah, the children of Kaz, the children of Barzillai, which took one of the daughters of Barzillai the Gileadite to wife, and was called after their name, these sought their register among those that were reckoned by genealogy, but it was not found. So here's a group of people that they were claiming to be of a certain lineage. They were saying, well, we're of, you know, um, <clears throat> the children of Kaz, the children of, of Barzillai, you know, and they're giving this whole thing. It says, they sought their register, they looked to be registered among those that were reckoned by genealogy, but it was not found. So the, the record of, of their genealogy was not found anywhere. So this is what happened. It says, therefore, were they as polluted put from the priesthood. Now, if you remember, this is, the Old Testament is, is, you can flip back to Genesis 5 if you want, is the Levitical priesthood. The sons of Levi were the ones in, uh, in the Mosaic law that had the charge, that had the responsibility of taking care of the tabernacle and doing the service of God and performing all the sacrifices and doing all these things. That was their job. And, and God singled them out and said, these are the people. You know, no one else, none of the other tribes are allowed to do this job. These are the ones I have chosen to do this work. And they received the tithes. They were taken care of in order to do God's work full time. That's what they were doing. So, if they could not tell whether or not you were of the lineage of Levi, if you were not, you know, um, had that, that bloodline, if you could not trace your genealogy back, you weren't allowed to become a priest because they did not want to pollute that priesthood. They did not want to have people who are not supposed to be doing this as in that job because it was, they, you know, cared about God's laws and that's the way that God made it. And it but it wasn't just for... Um, for that priesthood like we see here. Um, but it was also uh, important to know their genealogy for their inheritance. This is the way, that's the way that, that God had divided up the land unto them was according to the 12 tribes. He says, you know, um, each of the tribes had their own borders and their own sections of land that was their inheritance. And if you remember, you know, even if they were to sell their land at the, the year of Jubilee, everything would be returned to them. So there was no way that, that another tribe can just grow and, and take over and take up all the land because the inheritance was given to each of those tribes as their land. And that was something that they would continue to remain to have throughout the generations. Um, so in order to, to see where you fit in, you'd have to be able to show your genealogy for that reason as well. Now, um, many people today believe that the Jews have a right to the land of Israel because God has given it to them forever. This is, this is what people will, will say, they'll think today. Now, in order to know who really is a descendant of Israel, what would you need to do? Wouldn't you need to check a genealogy like they did in Ezra and Nehemiah? They had this problem in Ezra and Nehemiah. When they, they'd been dispersed. They went out. They'd been taken captive. You know, there's these intermarriages. There's all kinds of things going on. Their, their, their heritage is being polluted. Their, 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 um, you know, their bloodline is, is, is being changed because they're, they're, they're intermarrying and everything else. And um, they had to go back to their genealogy to determine, okay, these guys can be the priests. These, you know, this is your inheritance and all that other stuff. If we wanted to know for sure, okay, if we were to say, you know what? Yeah, God promised the, the nation of Israel that they would have that land. Because this is what a lot of Christians today believe. That these promises stand and that they deserve to have that land. And they'll be like, you know, we're pro-Israel, we side with Israel and all this other nonsense. In order to do that, to honestly do that, we would need to look at a genealogy. Now look at what the New Testament says about this. Turn to 1 Timothy chapter 1 because we're going to see what the Bible says in the New Testament about genealogies. 1 Timothy chapter 1, then we're going to go to Titus chapter 3. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse number 3 says, As I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus, when I went into Macedonia, that thou mightest charge some that they teach no other doctrine, neither give heed to fables, and endless genealogies which minister questions rather than godly edifying which is in the which is in faith so do 
So here we see the Apostle Paul writing to Timothy and saying, look, don't give heed, don't listen to these fab Jewish fables, these stories, these traditions, these endless genealogies, which minister questions. Because that's all it's going to do is it's going to raise more doubt rather than godly edifying, which is in faith. He's saying, don't even give heed to the genealogies. But some people say, oh, well, that just says endless genealogies. Okay, well, look at Titus chapter 3. Titus chapter 3, verse number 9. Because here's another, here's another young pastor. He was, he was giving advice to Timothy. Now he's giving advice to Titus. Both of these men were pastors. Titus chapter 3, verse number 9 says, But avoid foolish questions. So now he's telling t Titus. It's basically the same thing. To avoid certain things. Avoid foolish questions and genealogies. Okay, so there it doesn't say endless genealogies. It says genealogies. It says, avoid foolish questions and genealogies and contentions and strivings about the law, for they are unprofitable and vain. The New Testament tells us that we should avoid genealogies. We don't need them anymore. The reason why is because the Levitical priesthood is over. That ended with Jesus Christ, who is of the order of Mel Melchizedek. We do not observe the Levitical law, the, the Levitical laws of, of the sacrifices and those ordinances that they had, the, the washings, the, the sacrifices. None of that is in effect because the Levitical priesthood has ended. Jesus Christ ended the Levitical priesthood laws. And um, part of that was the genealogies. One of the reasons we needed genealogy in the first place was to see who could be a priest. We don't need that anymore. God has replaced the nation of Israel with a nation bringing forth the fruit serve. That's what Matthew 21 says. Turn, if you would, to um, Galatians chapter number 3 in the New Testament. Galatians chapter 3. Matthew 21, 42 says, Jesus saith unto them, Did ye never read in the Scriptures the stone which the builders rejected? The same has become the head of the corner. This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore, say I unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation bringing forth the, thr the fruits thereof. He was talking to the Pharisees. He was talking to the Sadducees. He was saying, didn't you ever read the stone which the builders rejected, which is Jesus Christ, is the stone that the builders rejected. He is the cornerstone. He is the rock. He is the foundation of our faith. It's Jesus Christ. He says, this is the Lord's doing. It's marvelous in our eyes. Because of this reason, because they have rejected Christ, because Jesus came unto his own and his own received him not, for this reason, the kingdom of God is taken from them. And it's given to a nation, not a person, not a group, but an entire nation bringing forth the fruits thereof. So what nation was it taken away from? The nation of Israel. He's taken away from the nation of Israel and he's given it to a nation bringing, so whoever, he says, whoever's going to do the fruits, just like when he talks about the olive tree and the wild olive tree and the branches being cut off and the wild branches being, being grafted in. And he's saying, well, but don't, you know, don't uh, boast yourself because it's just as easy. God can cut off you. you know, if you're a nation bringing forth the fruits thereof, you know, Israel was cut off, which was natural, you know, which was by nature an olive tree. Israel was cut off. The, you know, the, 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 um, the kingdom of God was taken away from them. It was given to another nation. But look, if you're not going to bring forth the fruits, if you're not going to do the work that God has laid out for you, if you're not going to you know, accept Him and accept His law and do what He says, then He'll take it away from you and, and find someone else to give it to. So, um, you know, God's not a respecter of persons. And this just proves that. Now, um, but, but why do so many people believe Israel has a right to that land? Because I didn't really cover that. I didn't, I didn't explain that very well yet. Genesis 13 explains why. What, you know, because there's a lot of Christians believe this. And they're being taught in their churches that, nope, they have a right to this land. And here's why. They think, they think that there's promises made that cannot be broken, that they're everlasting. And, um, and that's why that they have this land. And I'll read from you from Genesis 13 because this is where they get the promise from. Genesis 13, verse 14 says, And the Lord said unto Abram. So God's talking to Abraham, right? So the Lord said unto Abram, After that lot was separated from him, lift up now thine eyes 
and look from the place where thou art, northward and southward and eastward and westward, for all the land which thou seest, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed forever. So people say, oh, see right there. God gave this land as far as he could see. He gave all this land unto Abraham and to his seed forever. So they say, well, who's the seed of Abraham? Well, of course, it's Israel, right? That's the seed of Abraham. That's not what the Bible says in, Gen in Galatians chapter 3. If you're in Galatians chapter 3, take a look at Ge Galatians 3, verse number uh, 16. It covers this exact same promise made to Abraham. Galatians 3.16 says, Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. Right? We just saw the promise to give him that land for, forever, right? He saith not, and to seeds as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed which is Christ. We have a perfect explanation given to us in the New Testament explaining that the seed referred to in that promise made unto Abraham, that seed is Christ. It's one person. It's Jesus Christ. It's not the nation of Israel. It's not, it's not Jacob. It's not Isaac. It was made to Abraham, the person, and Jesus Christ, his seed. You can't get any more plain, clear English than, than it says in Galatians 3.16. And flip, you know, if you jump down to verse 28 of Galatians 3, it explains, For there is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And if ye be Christ's, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. The New Testament doctrine clearly explains that your nationality doesn't matter. That's why we avoid genealogies. Because it doesn't even matter. If you're in Christ, then you're one with Christ and you're one with everyone else that's in Christ. There isn't male or female. There isn't Jew or Greek. None of these things matter anymore because you're in Christ. And if you're in Christ, then you're a seed. Then you're an heir. You're Abraham's seed. He says, you are Abraham's seed. I am Abraham's seed this, this evening. You are Abraham's seed this morning. Why? Because you're in Christ. Because Christ was of Abraham's seed. We are, and because Galatians chapter 3 says so. Very clearly, very explicitly. We don't need these genealogies anymore. They're unprofitable and vain because we, we, the land was promised to Abraham, it was promised to Christ. And we are heirs together with um, faithful Abraham because we are in Christ. Now, Christ's genealogy was important because it needed to show the accomplishment of the prophecies of, of how he was going to come into being, of, you know, from Isaiah and many other places, of course, that explain that, that a, a virgin was going to give birth and he was going to be of the house of David and all, you know, all of the other prophecies. They needed the genealogy. We need that. We, we need that in God's word. And this is one of the reasons why we have all of these genealogies in the Bible. Because you can prove from God's word that Christ, that all these prophecies were fulfilled in Christ. When, and, and it's interesting too because we have, in the Old Testament, there's a, there's a bunch of places where you'll find genealogies. But in the New Testament, there's basically only two places. You have Matthew chapter 1 and Luke chapter 3. And both of those are talking about Christ's genealogy. And it's just explaining he's in the kingly line, he's of the house of David, he's of the tribe of Judah. He's, you know, all of these different things where he is fulfilling prophecies in so being through that genealogy, through that line. It's important, yes, because, because it fulfills prophecy and because we know that it does for a fact. Um, so it has to be in here. There is a benefit to learning it, but we don't need to be concerned with our genealogy. So you say, well, since the Bible says to avoid genealogy, should we just skip Genesis 5 because isn't it just all a genealogy then? No. Um, no, there's actually a lot we can learn from it. So when the Bible is talking about um, avoiding genealogies, it's also talking about avoiding foolish questions. It's people coming to you with these issues of their genealogy. It doesn't mean don't study and read about it in the Bible because 
that's just not what I was talking about. I was talking about you know people trying to get you sucked into this this vain current conversation or argument or debate about these genealogies because they don't matter. But what you can learn, we can, we can actually learn a lot from the genealogies. And I and I've started this project of uh, I've got a spreadsheet. I'm, I'm because you learn a lot. You can compare the genealogies and you can see who is related and you start to learn a lot more. Like when you look at, um, it's interesting just kind of looking at the life of David and his relatives. You know that Joab was David's, I forgot if it was his nephew or his cousin. Um, I think it's his nephew. And um, because he's the son of Zeruiah, and I think Zeruiah was David's sister. You, you, you start to learn all these different things, and you see the dynamics, and, and you kind of understand the stories better, you understand the Bible better. And you end up learning things like um, in this genealogy, we learn, we could learn for one, how many years had uh, passed by the time from, from the day that from when Adam was made until the day of the flood. You can learn that just from Genesis chapter 5. And um, we can see here it was, uh, I don't have it written down, I think it was like, it's like 1,000, oh man, I didn't have that in my notes. I've got it, I've got it on my, on my spreadsheet. It's like 1,656 years is the amount of time. And you can just, you could do that, it's very simple math. You just add up you know, Adam was 130 years old when he had Seth. So there's, from the time he was born, 130. And then it gives us when Seth had a child. So you add that years. And then when his son had a son. And then you add that. And you keep on adding until um, you get to Noah. And then, of course, it tells us that Noah was 600 years old when the flood came upon the earth. So um, you add all of those years up. And you can get the, um, how many years had gone by before God brought his judgment on the earth, and we can learn from that as well that Methuselah died within a year of the flood on the earth. So Methuselah, and he was the one that, that had to live, live the longest, uh, nine, was it 969 years? And um, he lived all the way up. Until, now, we don't know, because the Bible doesn't record if he actually died in the flood, if that's why he he kept, his life was cut short, or if he died of natural cause, or what, you know, what exactly the reason is. But it's kind of interesting to even see that and to note that, that he lived all the way up until the year of the flood. And there's a lot of other things that you can learn by studying these genealogies and, and studying them out. And um, you'll find places where people are skipped over, and their name isn't even recorded in a genealogy. And, you, and you'll see sometimes it's, it, you know, it's real wicked people that they're not even included in a, in, a, in a genealogy, but we read about them somewhere else and, and understand that they were, um, you know, that they were not that great of a person. And it, uh, it would seem that that would be why they have been removed from um, being listed. But um, let's look at Genesis 5. We're in Genesis 5, right? Yes. Look at verse number 22, because there's a, Enoch is a, is a character we're going to, we're going to focus in on a little bit for pretty much the rest of the sermon. Chapter, or verse 22 says, And Enoch walked with God after he begat Methuselah 300 years and begat sons and daughters. Now, first thing I want to point out there, it says Enoch walked with God after he begat Methuselah. So, obviously, walking with God is a good thing. Do you agree? Walking with God, where you're, you know, you're close with God, you're doing the right thing, you're, you're walking in his, according to his will, you're walking with God. But it kind of it points out, it says that, that he was walking with God after he had his son, after Methuselah. And there's something about, about having children, I think, in general, where people kind of wake up a little bit. You have a tendency to be a lot more selfish, even sometimes when you get married, when you don't have the responsibility of raising a child and, and bringing and nurturing that, that person up. Um, there are many things that maybe you used to do that were sinful. When you have a child, you're like, well, wait, I don't want my child to do these things. I want what's best for them. And you look at that child like, you want to give them the best opportunity possible because you love them. And you think of all the things that you've done wrong. I don't want my child doing these things. And I don't want them picking up bad habits for me. I don't want me seeing these, I don't want him seeing me do these things so that they start doing them. 
right? And, and I know that worked with me and it works with just about everybody. Um, when you have your child, you, you really start examining a lot more of the things that you do with your life and you start to walk closer to God. And I don't think it's a coincidence that the Bible says that here with, um, with Enoch walking with God after he begat Methuselah. It says 300 years he begat sons and daughters. And then it says in verse 23, and all the days of Enoch were 360 and five years. So you think, oh wait, why did, you know, everyone else is living to be 800, 900 years old. Enoch only lived to be 365. What's up with that? Verse number 24 says, and Enoch walked with God and he was not for God took him. So here, Enoch must have been a pretty righteous man. He, he says here he's, he walked with God. Twice it says that he walked with God. And then it says he was not. So he, he essentially, he died. It doesn't really, it's not that clear here. It just says he was not because God took him. And um, we get a little bit more information. Turn to Hebrews chapter 11, if you would, real quick. We're going to see here a verse about Enoch in Hebrews 11. We're going to see a couple references to Enoch. Because we don't get very much about Enoch. There's more about Enoch in the New Testament than there is in the Old Testament. This is basically what we get about Enoch in the Old Testament. Is that he walked with God and then he was not. 365 years. Hebrews 11 verse 5 says, By faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death. So Enoch didn't die. Because that, when it says here that God took him, that's what it means. It says he, he was just translated. God just took him. He literally just took him. He didn't even die. God just took him to be with him. It says, Enoch, that he should not see death and was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. So he pleased God so much that God just said, I'm just going to take you now. And for whatever reason, I don't know why that was God's will, but it was God's will. Enoch was walking in God's will, and he apparently was blessed to be able to just be taken by God at 365 years old. Um, that's pretty amazing. Turn, if you would, now to Jude. Book of Jude, right before the book of Revelation, you'll find Jude. There's another reference to Enoch. And what's really cool here is that we get a quote from Enoch. All the way, almost at the very end of the Bible, we have Jude. And Jude ends up quoting Enoch. It says in verse 14 of Jude, And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed and of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. This is a quote um, that Enoch had stated and, it's, and we could see here that Enoch was a prophet. Obviously, he walked with God. He was a prophet. God had given him this knowledge, which wasn't really revealed all the way until the book of Jude, when it was actually written down. And um, it's amazing the way that God's word operates and the way that God reveals things unto men of God to even know this. I mean, you could say, well, how in the world can Jude have known what Enoch said? I mean, this is before the flood. This is, we're talking thousands of years, right? How does Jude know what, what Enoch said? And honestly, we don't have, we don't see any evidence of a written record being, being transmitted for the Bible until Moses. Moses is the one that wrote the book of Genesis, which goes over all of these stories about Adam and Eve and Cain and Abel and, and everything that we see in the Old Testament, Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, Israel. All this stuff is written down by, Mo by Moses. This is when it's first recorded written. Now, the Bible explains that, that holy men of God spake in time past as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So God used holy men of God to preach His Word, and there was this, this oral um, giving of God's Word. We don't necessarily see any evidence of it being written down prior to Mo Moses. But... Um, what a lot of people do is because they don't understand this, they'll say, well, how, this, you know, the same question, how does Jude know this? Well, it was revealed to Jude. How did Jude know anything to write in here is given to, to him of God? God's the one that revealed his word in order to, in order to, um, 
<coughs> to give unto the people, right? So God had given him this knowledge to, to, to write down, to have in his word. But what some people will do is they'll say, well, no, there must have been a book of Enoch. And you'll hear about this book. And you have these book of Jasher, but you know, the gospel according to Thomas and all these, all these other books, right? And people are, yeah, the apocryphal books. There's all kinds of different books that people will turn to and be like, well, what about this? Isn't this scripture? Well, I think this should be scripture. I think this should be. What's funny is that if you're saved, you know, we've gone over this in the, in the study of John. He says, my sheep hear my voice. Jesus Christ is the word. There's something about the Bible you know it's God's word when you hear it. You can read it and, and look at it and know, and you just you know you're hearing God's word. And when you hear these false versions, you're like, it doesn't it, it does not sound like God at all. It's not God's voice. But when we read this, you know that it is. And when you like when you, for example, you read the Book of Mormon, because I have I haven't read the whole thing, but I've read different passages and stuff. It's stupid. It really is stupid. I mean, you, you read the Bible, it's incredible. And then you read the Book of Mormon, it doesn't even match up. And it's, it's such a fraud, it's such an imposter. It's so obvious that, you know, the, the attempts that they make, they try to use biblical language, they, they try to use stories and insert statements that you've already read before so that it might sound familiar to you. Oh yeah, that sounds like the Bible because they'll just paraphrase another section or, or rip one verse out and put it in their Book of Mormon to make it look like, oh, see, this is talking about the same thing. Oh, this must be of God. The book of Enoch does the same thing. I was actually listening to it last night. It's not, it's not on YouTube, people reading the whole book. It's a, it's a long book, too. There's, like, there's a lot to it. And right off the bat, you could tell this is phony. This is, a fr this is not the word of God. Okay, And it's kind of interesting, too, because I, I didn't do that much research into it to tell. From what I understand, people believe it was written around 200 B.C. So, like way, 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 way after Enoch anyways. I don't know why people think that, that this book was, is legitimate and that it was actually from Enoch. The only reason they even come up with this and the reason why this was probably invented is because of what's written in Jude. Is because that there's this quote and so there must have been a book, a book according to Enoch and this is what it says. And... Um, I'm not sure about the date when they, when they claim that it was written. But it's actually very similar. If you read any of the other um, Jewish writings from that time, they're, they're very similar in, in the way that they're, that they're written. But they're, they're not like the Bible. They, they insert these, these stories and they insert actual verses from the Bible to, make, to try to pawn it off as the Bible, but it's not. Um, so don't get too sucked into that. Um, there's a very good reason why the book of Enoch is not scripture, just like the apocryphal books. Now, another thing, and this will be the, the last thing that we cover tonight, I think, is um, almost the last thing. People will point to Enoch as being a picture of the rapture. And I'll agree with that. I, I think it is, um, in, in a way, it's a, it's a picture of the rapture because we see Enoch is translated, right? He didn't die. He's actually translated. He goes up to be with God, which is exactly what's going to happen in, um, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. The Bible says, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. See, referring to death, right? We're not all going to die, but we shall all be changed. Right? Enoch was translated. We shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. So in that sense, sure, Enoch looks like a pretty good picture of, of the rapture, right? Of, of being caught up um, and, and having our bodies changed. But what a lot of people will try to say is that he's a picture of the pre-trib rapture. And what they'll say is they'll see, look, Enoch was caught up before God poured out, you know, before God had the, the flood upon the earth and he poured out his wrath. Now, first of all, I believe that the rapture is going to take for, place before God pours out his wrath, right? Because the, God's wrath is not tribulation. The tribulation is going to come from the Antichrist, it's going to come from other places. But 
Think about this now. It, these people, when we, when we read through Genesis chapter 5, you read through that pretty quick, right? It takes about a minute or two to just read through the chapter. So you're going from Enoch to Noah in a very, very, very short period of time. But in actual years, <laughs> there's a really long time between Enoch being you know, raptured out, so to speak, and the flood actually coming upon the earth. And because we have this genealogy, we can actually calculate the amount of time. And Enoch was translated 669 years before the flood. That's a long time. You're going to say, this is a picture of the rest. See, God's going to save his people out before that, that tribulation comes, before that wrath comes, right? 669 years. To put it in perspective, 669 years, that would be like today's 2015. That would be the year 1346. So if, 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 if God's wrath is going to be poured out in the year 2015, this year, if God's wrath was coming, then we should have been raptured out in the year 1346. For this, for this to make sense as far as being, a, or even to be close, right? I mean, let's say, oh, well, it's not exact, right? Okay, yeah, we're still talking, you know, almost 700 years. That's a long time. No, the Bible actually talks about Noah being more representative of the Christian, of the, of the righteous man, of the preacher of righteousness who is spared from God's wrath. Noah's the one who, when everybody else died, he was protected. He was lifted up above the waters when everybody else died. The Bible tells us in Matthew 24, because Matthew 24 references, as, as well as Luke 17, references Noah and references the flood. And it likens, you know, the, 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 the rapture to these events. It, it also references Lot and Sodom. And it says in verse uh, 37 of Matthew 24, But as the days of Noe were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. So when Jesus Christ comes back, just like it was in the days of Noah, it says, so shall it be with the Son of Man. Now, he doesn't mention Enoch anywhere. He mentions Noah. He says, For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah, Noe entered into the ark. So he's saying, Things are going to continue all the way up until the day that Noah entered into the ark and knew not until the flood came and took them all away. So shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. And the Bible is very clear that the same day that Noah went in the ark is the same day that the flood came. He wasn't sitting around in there for a week. He wasn't sitting around in there for any amount of time. The same day that Noah went into that ark is the same day that it started to rain and the, the, the floods break loose and the flood was upon the whole earth. Just like it says, the same day that Lot was taken out of, out of Sodom, the very same day fire and brimstone rained down and destroyed it. These are both images or pictures from the past that were given for us to understand, hey, this is going to be the same exact way with the coming of the Son of Man. Because both of those are evidences of God pouring out His wrath. The worldwide flood, that wasn't just tribulation, that was God's wrath because He was destroying everybody and everything and every creature and every animal, everything. Wiping it out because He was angry because the world had gotten so wicked. Sodom, Gomorrah, yeah, that was God raining fire and brimstone down in his anger, in his wrath at the extreme wickedness and perversion that was going on in the land of Sodom. He poured out his wrath, but the just were saved. Noah was the just, Lot was just, because they believed. They were believers. They had their faith in God. They were spared. They were taken out before God's wrath came down the same exact way that we will be taken out before God's wrath comes down upon this earth, but not before the tribulation. Genesis chapter 5, let's finish up here. Genesis chapter 5, verse 28 says, And Lamech lived in hundred eighty and two years and begat a son. And he called his name Noah, saying, this same shall comfort us concerning our work and toil of our hands because of the ground which the Lord hath cursed. Now, here we see a prophecy basically from Lamech, Noah's father. 
And if you remember, uh, one of the curses on Adam for disobeying and sinning was God was going to bring forth you know, thorns and basically make him work very, very hard because of the sin which he had committed. But we see here that Lamech prophesies, well, Noah's going to comfort us concerning our work, the toil of our hands, how difficult it was for them because of the ground that God had cursed. God literally cursed the ground and made it extremely difficult to bring forth food. But he says, in Noah, we're going to get comfort. We're going to get a respite from, from, this, from this curse on the ground. And flip over, we're going to uh, close with this, Genesis chapter 8. We see the fulfillment of this prophecy by Lamech that, that he was correct. Because in Genesis 8, look at verse number 20. It says, And Noah built an altar unto the Lord, and took of every clean beast, and of every clean fowl, and offered burnt offerings on the altar. And the Lord smelled a sweet savor, and the Lord said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground any more for man's sake. For the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth, neither will I again smite any more every living thing everything living as I have done. So, God's curse has been removed from the land. Now, we still have to work as men. We still have to work hard to provide the food. But the, the, the way that the ground brings forth now is not the same as it was when Adam was alive, when, and when all the generation was before the flood, because God had cursed the ground and made it really bad. But we finally get, after God wiped everything out and destroyed it all, he lifted that curse from off of the ground and he says, I'm not going to curse the ground anymore. I'm not going to do that. And we also have the promise that he's not going to wipe out everything living anymore, um, which is also important to know for prophecy as well, because there's some people that think that during the wrath of God, that all mankind is going to be wiped out. But that's not true either. He promises right here, neither will I again smite anymore everything living as I have done. He's not going to kill everybody. Which also makes sense because after, when God's wrath is poured out, there are going to still be people after that whole, the whole time frame is done that are going to be here during the millennial reign of Christ. And yes, there will still be unbelievers during that time because at the end of the millennium, when there's going to be Gog and Magog in this whole battle, when Satan's going to round up the rest of the, of, the, of the unbelievers to battle against God, that is the final battle. And then there's going to be the new heaven and the new earth and everything um, will be different from that. But during that time, there will still be unbelievers because God did not, does not wipe everybody out during the time of the great tribulation um, in a, you know, with the great wrath in that, that seven-year period, um, not everyone's going to be wiped out. And we see that. Otherwise, his promise wouldn't be true here in, in, in Genesis chapter 8. So there's a lot we can learn. Um, you know, hopefully you don't just gloss over these chapters. It's easy to do sometimes, but I would recommend digging into some of these genealogies. You could learn a lot. And there's actually a lot more that I wanted to go into about the genealogy but I don't have answers for, for a lot of the stuff yet. When you start comparing genealogies, you'll see some, some discrepancies, and, and there's always a reason for it. There's always, and it's, it's an amazing reason when you figure out why it is, because it's not a mistake. There aren't mistakes and errors in the Bible. It's just sometimes things don't, don't make sense right away, and you look at it, and it just seems like, well, wait a minute. Where is this person? Why is this person left out? And um, I wanted to get into that, but it's, it really requires a deep study. I was, I was starting to compare um, Luke chapter 3 with, with this genealogy in Genesis. And, um, and it's really interesting because um, Cainan is actually the one person that's missing in, the, in the whole, uh, that whole lineage uh, up to Noah. And... Um, there's, there's a lot of things that you can study and look up and we can learn from these genealogies. But um, let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for, um, for your word. 
And I pray that you would please continue to teach us and help us to learn more about you. God, help us not to just skip over these genealogies. There's a lot of interesting things we can learn and more that we could understand. It's helpful to understand that these time frames, dear Lord, to understand what's going on. It's easy to read through real quickly a course of events. It's another thing to understand. Well, no, this actually took place over the course of 1,600 years. That's a, that's a long time for these events to play out. And it even shows a lot of your long suffering too with the, you know, how long it took for some of the wickedness to get so bad to the point to where you decided that you had to destroy the world with a flood. And um, just help us to learn more. Help us not to just to, to skim over this stuff, dear Lord, but really to take it in and to start learning these names and learning these people and learning um, um, who they were related to and, and um, that we could just get a much deeper and broader understanding of the events of the Bible, dear Lord, and um, help us not to get caught up in these this endless genealogies and these people that would have us to think that you are a respecter of persons and that and that there is something special about the nation of Israel or the physical seed of Abraham, since you've already told us that God is able of these stones to raise up seed unto Abraham. Lord, help us understand the promises that were made very clear in the New Testament um, regarding the Old Testament promises, God. And uh, it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.